Hello my friends, welcome to my channel. I just came back from the supermarket and I enjoy the supermarket. I like the smells, I like the taste of the food and all of a sudden I realized that I now am smelling something which I haven't smelled for a year. Hamantaschen. It's almost Purim. And if it's almost Purim, I think what I would like to do in this particular lecture is deal with the story of Purim in my own way. Some things I think are original thoughts. Many things are stolen from others. Who doesn't do that? So, with your permission, we're going to begin. Uh, a scholar named Hoshander wrote a book entitled The Book of Esther in the Light of History. And Hoshander mentions many problems that we have with the book of Esther, with Megillat Esther. One of the problems is the fact that God's name does not appear in the Megillah. Another problem is the fact that we have a list of names of stars of the Megillah who are not found in the history books. Hoshander wonders, isn't it possible that the Megillat Esther is a fairy tale? Or what I like to call a Boba Misa? Could be. Why could it be? Well, for example, the name of Hashverosh. We have historians such as Herodotus who mention the names of Persian kings and queens. No Achashverosh. Who is Achashverosh? Another thing, many people assume that the whole story of Purim is a very interesting fairy tale, but not more than that. After all, where are you going to find a story of a king who makes a party for 180 days and another party for seven days, etc., etc., etc.? Hoshander has a point there. In fact, he even suggests the possibility that the story of Purim was taken from some Persian mythology, some Persian legend, and is being used with so-called Jewish names. I'd like to begin with that aspect. Achashverosh Vayihi bimei Achashverosh Who is he? We're told by some historians that Achashverosh is the king Xerxes, the king that the Greeks called Xerxes. But wait a minute. The Persians also had a name for that particular king, and that name is something like Khshayarsh in Persian, which means Achashverosh, Xerxes, Khshayarsh. And by the way, if you look in the last chapter of Megillat Esther, you will find that the chapter has nothing to do with the story of Esther. It's like a chronicle of the Persian Empire, and in that particular chapter, Achashverosh is written Chet 
שין וו רש שין חשרעש נאנה חשרי ראש So is this really only a Boba Misa? Let me begin with a very interesting theory. In Hebrew, we have consonants and vowels, right? Now, I was taught by my wife, I was taught that the Hebrew language does not accept uh, consonants together without vowels, such as, to give you an example, let's take the word sport. The SP of sport, sp, there are two consonants, right? The S and the P. But in Hebrew, you can say sport because two consonants can't go together. You have to find a way to weaken them, to change them a little bit, to make them sound better. So what do you do? You find a way of, in the middle of sport, finding a vowel, or if you can't find a vowel in the middle of sport, you'll add a vowel to the word sport at the beginning of the word. And you won't say sport, but if you look in certain dictionaries, you will find that sport is translated into Hebrew the following way, asport. Why asport? In order to make a change, in order to find a way of breaking up the SP, the SP, we therefore weaken it by saying not sport, but by saying asport. Now, maybe there's a name, Khsharsh, and we decide, in order to make it more into Hebrew, we don't say Khsharsh, we say Akhsharsh. And then again, maybe we don't really say Akhsharsh. Maybe we have to, uh, in some way, make it sound a little more for the ear of the Jewish listener. And to make a long story short, Achshash or Achshash turned into Achashverosh because that's what sounds good for us and that will solve my problem, maybe, with Hoshander. And say, Achashverosh is the way that the grammarians of Hebrew found the, the possibility of using the letters and changing them in certain ways that they would sound better to the Jewish ear. Now, here I have to add something which I think is very important. Um, we know that King Xerxes, in the third year of his reign, decided to go to war against Greece. The Persians were preparing an attack on Greece. This is a fact. What did he do? He invited representatives of all the nations under his command to come to Shushan, the capital of Persia, for consultations. To make a long story a little bit shorter, it was 180 days of consultations. Consultations with whom? With the 127 representatives of the Persian Empire. So now you get a different story entirely. Listen, my friends. 
I, King Ahasuerus, intend to go to war against Greeks. I just don't like Greeks. But I need help. Therefore, I am inviting members of the 127 satraps, they're called. I never know what a satrap is. Sometimes I say a rat trap, but, but what's the difference? I am inviting them for consultation. I want to find out how many soldiers they can give me. I want to find out how many weapons. I want to find out all kinds of things that will help me in my preparation for a war against Greece. And group by group they come. It's not that they all come together for 180 days. Week number one, this satrap comes. Week number two, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And now, my dear friends, you see, now I can explain why 180 days. It's consultations for 180 days with 127 groups. To some of you this is a surprise? Good, let's continue with the surprise. Now, when they come to Shushan, uh, what do they have in common? One thing, that on the table they're a knishis. That's for sure. Meaning, as you know, those of you who know something about uh, Israeli politics, and know uh, what goes on uh, in Israeli cabinet meetings, you will never see a picture of an Israeli cabinet meeting without Coca-Cola and Knishis. So that's what you had. Knishis for 180 days. For the different groups of people who are coming. For the 127 representatives who are coming to decide how to go to war against Greece. Now we have another problem. Where do you um, billet? You know the word billet, B-I-L-L-E-T? You should know it because at least any Yankees among you know the fact that uh, part of the reasons for the uh, Revolutionary War against Britain was the fact that British soldiers were billeted in the homes of uh, citizens of Boston, etc. Uh, they were put there without the permission or the happiness of the local citizenry, but that's what had to be done. Because whether you knew it or not, there was no Shushan Hilton. No such thing. Maybe there was a special hotel for a few of the main uh, uh, people involved. But all of the groups had to be billeted. And where are they billeted? In the homes. Now I can understand, number one, I can understand why we have 180 days. And I can also understand why right at the end of the 180-day period of consultation, the king made an open house for seven days for all the people of Shushan who had gone through God knows what during that 180-day period. You see, it's beginning to make sense. The 180 days makes sense. 127 uh, uh, makes sense. A week of celebration, of open house of the king, also makes sense. Now we can continue. So, in the third year of Ahasuerus' reign, a decision was made to go to war against Greece. In order to show how happy Ahasuerus was with his citizens, he made a blast of a party on the third year of his reign. He made a blast of a party for seven days to show his appreciation to all the people. 
Now, naturally, what, why do I say party? The word is mishte. Vayihi bimei achashverosh hu achashverosh hamolech mehod uvadkus da 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 bishnat shalosh lemalcho asa mishte. Why mishte? Why not misiba? Mishte comes from the word mishtot. Lama mishte? Because they're a mishte. Everybody is shote. Because they're all drinking. And they're all a little bit crazy. And then we begin reading some parts of the Megillah, which already now will make sense. And for a moment, you will excuse me, I will put on my glasses, even if you don't see my beautiful eyes. Um, anyhow, he says, uh, we have a list of, of uh, all of the stuff that is given at that seven-day party. And all of a sudden, on the seventh verse of the Megillah, the Baal Kolei reads as follows. V'hashkot b'chlei zahav v'chelim mikelim shonim I don't know how many of you realize what I'm singing, but the tune of Vikelim Mikelim Shonim is the same tune that we use for Megillat Eicha. Eicha Yashva Badad. Vikelim Mikelim Shonim. The idea is that the king who was making his drunken parties took vessels from the Beit HaMikdash and used them. And that's why we cry about it. And as you're going to see, that's why the Baal Kore, uh, if he's an expert, now we had an expert, a guy named Shalamach, in my father's shul in Washington Heights. Shalamach had been the uh, sexton the cantor uh, of the Jewish community in Shanghai during the war, World War II. And he looked a little bit like a Chinaman, and he would talk like a Chinaman, but he had the greatest nusach. And when he said, V'keilim mi keilim shonim, you could begin crying with him, because you saw what was going on, what he meant. And then, all of a sudden, Gam Vashti Hamalka Asta Mishte Nashim. Vashti. Who is Vashti? Hoshanda will ask again, Vashti? We don't know any Persian princess named Vashti. And maybe we even have somewhere a name of the wife of Xerxes. But she ain't Vashti. Until some Persian friend of mine, I checked it out, said, Vashti is not a name. Vashti is what you call her. Vashti means Shafa, cutie pie. Vashti Hamalka was this good-looking girl named Vashti, and she made a party for the women. We won't go now into the, the obvious reasons why uh, the women were separated from the men. Uh, she was also a princess. And she made a party for the women, which was separate from the party of the men. And, of course, coming back to my glasses, of course, uh... The king inv made a party, uh, uh, excuse me, Vashti made a party for the women. I'm getting shicker with all this, so that's why I said Vashti made a party for the women. And we now continue. Bayom HaShvi'i, on the seventh day, Ketov Lev HaMelech Beyayin. You know what Ketov Lev HaMelech Beyayin means? He was drunk. Ketov Lev HaMelech Be'ayin, Amar, 
to Mahuman Bista Harvona Bikta Avakta Zeta Vekarkas Shivat Hasorisim Hamishartim et Peneha Melachashveros. You know what a Saris is? A Saris is a eunuch. And you know why they're eunuchs? Because they're working in the in the harem. And if they won't be eunuchs, you're gonna have a lot of pregnant women in the harem. Anyhow, he commands Lahavi et Vashti ha Nehamelech to bring Queen Vashti, who has, by the way, we get the impression that she comes from a, a royal family. Lahavi et Vashti ha Beketer Malchut to bring her to the men's party Beketer Malchut and do you know what some of the commentators say? I hope you're not going to close off my uh, uh, lecture now because uh, some of the commentators say he was so drunk that he said I want Vashti HaMelech HaMalka to come to my party Beketer Malchut with a royal crown, meaning only with a royal crown, naked. And of course she refused. And she wouldn't do it. And she wouldn't come. Anyhow, this is the beginning. May we continue? I think what I should do right now is mention something that uh, I think is extremely important about the time lapse. We began this story in the third year of Ahasuerus. And the story continues until the 11th year of Ahasuerus. That's a long time. Why is this important? This is important because if in the third year of Ahasuerus he made a party and according to tradition Mordechai the Jew was very very upset at the fact that Ahasuerus made a party and that a lot of Jewish kids came to the party to eat the tray for food and he told them not to do it but they did it anyhow and then they said, what do you want? We have a crazy king. We're not going to go to the party. We have to go. Pikuach nefesh. We have to save lives. And the truth of the matter was that maybe because of the fact that they ate treif, the third year of Ahasuerus' reign, when were they punished? In the 11th year of Ahasuerus' reign. A long time went by before they were punished. Just as we have a very, very interesting story concerning uh, King Saul and Amalek. 